Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I have a Kenwood L07C Mark II to restore. This is owned by the same person who has the Kenwood L07Ms that I worked on. And this is the matching preamp to those. He wants me to go through this and restore this just as I did with the L07M Mark IIs. So everything from the internal rework of all the components to the external cleaning and touch up of the cosmetics. This thing's pretty nasty. It's gonna need a lot of cleaning and a lot of areas touched up. Electrically, it's gonna need a full recap. There's over 70 electrolytic capacitors in this thing that need to be changed. And it also uses the black flag capacitors too. So those have to be uh, replaced as well. He also got Cardis RCA inputs and outputs for it, as well as a FureTech IEC inlet and the black anodized aluminum feet that I installed on the monoblocks as well. So it'll be a matching set. So let's get the top cover removed, take a look at what we have to do. So here it is with the top panel removed. I've since taken a parts count and placed an order on Mauser for everything I don't have in stock. I'm gonna change the regulators out in the power supply. Those like to run hot the trimmers for the plus and minus uh, voltage rails, the uh, black flag capacitors that are used absolutely everywhere in this thing. Every single one of those has to be changed out. I think there's uh, 28 of those. All of the electrolytic capacitors, these are all Marcone, and these like to fail quite a bit, so those are all getting changed out. These green metal film or fusible resistors, these like to drift. They run very hot, so I have uh, Dale resistors coming in to replace those. The traces in the Mark I L07C are really, really hard to work with. Um, I don't think I'm going to be working on another one of those anytime soon. The traces just like to lift and fall off no matter how careful you are. So I'm hoping the updated board in this thing is going to be easier to work with. I'm not holding my breath though. You can see almost every single electrolytic capacitor has uh, corrosive glue used on it. So I'm going to have to do a lot of scraping. It doesn't look like it's turned corrosive just yet. but. In some areas it's turning dark and that's usually when it starts so i'm going to flip this around and uh start tearing this thing apart i think i'm going to tear the whole chassis apart and remove the main board and the power supply board from the uh from the chassis so let's get to it so here's the l07c mark ii with the bottom panel removed you can see there's a lot of stuff going on signal wires power supply wiring um, you have all your signal switches and potentiometers with the control shafts that lead up to the front. So every single one of those has to be taken apart just to get the main board out. You can see all the traces are starting to bubble. That's normal for older preamps like this that use this manufacturer of these PCBs. Um, hopefully this preamp is going to be easier to service than the Mark 1 because I know the Mark 1, the traces just fall off as soon as you touch them. So hopefully when they updated the board, they figured that out, but it's definitely not, uh, not too pretty. So we'll figure that out as we go. The transformer sits in the sealed box right here, and then you have the separate power supply board uh, just behind it. But uh, overall, it's a pretty clean layout. They achieved quite good specifications, so they definitely did something right with this. But for servicing, doesn't uh, doesn't really look to be too easy. So we'll figure that out as we go. Okay, I'm making some progress on the disassembly. I have the faceplate off and I have a bunch of the chassis panels removed. You see this foam that they used is just disintegrating. So I'm gonna keep going and uh, hopefully don't run into any issues. Some of the other parts are over here. So I'm gonna keep going and uh, we'll come back when I get go further. Here's a tool I get a lot of use out of. This is an OK Industries HW-UW-224. This is a wire wrap and unwrap tool. And when you have wire wraps like this, all you have to do to remove them is put this on the post, twist it, and pull the wire right off. Makes everything a lot easier to disassemble 
And then when you're ready, you can just wrap that back on and put some solder on it. It's a great tool. So I'm getting a little bit further. I have the center support for all the potentiometers as well as the center brace for the circuit board out. This gains me a lot more access to the solder joints. Also allows me to uh, service these controls a lot easier. I have the side panel off as well. Now I'm gonna get the rear panel off. I think I'm gonna leave the transformer in and this side of the chassis intact because once I take all that all apart, it just becomes kind of a cluster. So probably just gonna leave all that in and work from here. I'll make things a little bit easier. It appears that all of the inputs and the outputs are socketed. So all these cables that lead up to the RC jacks just unclip from the board. Some of these posts are gold plated and they're in good shape. But if I show you these center ones, you'll see that they're all completely oxidized. So those are gonna have to be cleaned up. I think it's because the pins are gold and I think the pins down here are silver plated. So dissimilar metal cause corrosion. So I'm gonna keep going and uh, get this rear panel off. I think I'm gonna have to cut some wires too. So stay tuned. Okay, coming back after a few days, the parts showed up. So I have everything I need to complete the restoration. And I have front and rear plate removed, as well as the side supports for the main circuit board, as well as the power supply board. I still have the power supply in its cradle. I think I'm gonna leave it like that. It's just easier to work on, less stuff to take apart. I've been uh, removing capacitors and I've been having to scrape a lot of glue. There's a lot of glue on this board. Most every single capacitor that's used is held down with this stupid glue. So lots of work to do. Um, I've been using toluene and acetone to remove it. And uh, it seems to be working pretty well. But yeah, there's a lot to do. I have the uh, chassis torn apart and all the parts further over here, including the rear plate. kind of like a jigsaw puzzle right now so I'm gonna keep going and I'll uh, give you guys an update shortly I've begun the recap process on this uh, preamp and I want to show you how good this toluene is that I use you get this at any hardware store it comes in a big one gallon jug and I just put it in a little vial like this and what I do is I apply it to the board with an acid brush everywhere the glue is and I let it sit and I use a uh, chopstick basically a piece of bamboo that I have sanded down to a wedge and this stuff just picks right off very easily no board damage you don't have to scratch the board using metal tools or anything so this is a good substitute for that works really well so I'm gonna keep going and uh, as usual I will come back with an update shortly so here's the completely nasty bottom side of the circuit board before I'm about to rework it it's disgusting Tons of flux, tons of dry solder joints, tons of grime and dirt. Just really nasty. Lots of glue. Yeah, this is pretty bad. Power supply is also really bad. Lots of high heat areas too. So I'm gonna uh, get started. Probably take me a couple hours to do this. Wish me luck.
So I'm still plugging away at this thing. Still a lot to do. I'm in the process of uh, getting the caps in the center changed out. There's still lots of areas that need attention. Lots of glue. And uh, I wanted to show one of the tools that I use. There's hardly any space in between these two uh, switches and potentiometer. So uh, to cut the leads, I have this tool right here. This is an Aram 673E. And what it is, is it's a flush cutter on the top. So all you do is you come in here where you can't really get a pair of flush cutters and you just trim these off. It uh, comes in handy. Just like that. Oh, this one. And just like that, they're all gone. I just gotta clean up the mess it made. But uh, yeah, these things are pretty cool. I use these all the time. I have a lot of pliers that I use all the time. Um, lots of dikes, flush cuts, needle nose pliers, crimpers, strippers, you name it. These are pretty cool. These are for thin gauge wire. These are Aram uh, 552S. And uh, you can strip really, really thin wire with them. They're uh, adjustable. Use those all the time too for uh, like uh, cat five wiring, using that as uh, like solder bridges or you know stuff like that. So I'm gonna keep going and uh, come back shortly. I just wanted to point something out really quickly about the Mark II versus the Mark I. Uh, with the Mark I, a lot of the holes in the circuit board used to put the capacitor leads through, they use vias. So inevitably when you remove the capacitor, you end up pulling traces and uh, vias through the circuit board, no matter how careful you are. Um, but with the Mark II, instead of running the top traces directly to the hole in the circuit board for the capacitor leg, what they do is they run it directly next to the hole and they connect the top to the bottom with a via uh, on the side. So that way when you remove the cap, you don't destroy the board. And that was very annoying on the Mark I. Um, almost every single trace I touched in one of those things uh, lifted and I had a really hard time getting it solved. Um, so. You can see the trace starting at this resistor leg right here going over. And before it goes to this hole, it just connects through a V on the side. But on the Mark I, they had all these all over the place where these, these top traces would just go directly to the capacitor hole. I'll show you on the bottom side. Sorry for the shaky video. You can see the hole in the, in the board for the capacitor right here. And on the side, you have the via. So, makes it a lot easier. They obviously saw their design flaw and they corrected it in the Mark II, which is uh, appreciated. So I'm back after a few days. I've been working on this thing on and off. I have all the electrolytic capacitors replaced and I even changed a couple with uh, some Wema MKP film caps. So I'm going to start pulling the black flag capacitors out now. I have all my ceramic capacitors that I'm going to change them out with ready to go. I have everything labeled so I can just pick it out of the bag fast and get it onto the board. Um, you can see that Ken would kind of drop the ball here in terms of these uh, capacitors. These things are really susceptible to heat. Um, and you can see that they have them just right up against the dropping resistors that they use on the circuit board. And these things run hot. Um, so I'm surprised that this preamp worked at all and didn't oscillate when I got it because these, I'm pretty sure these capacitors are all junk by now. A lot of them are next to transistors, which run hot. And like I said, dropping resistors. So I'm going to put in C0, uh, C0Gs, which are less susceptible to heat. They're much more thermally stable uh, to replace these. And they're a lot smaller too. So they're still going to sit a lot lower on the circuit board. And same in the power supply. These two heat sinks right here get really, really hot. And they have these just sitting right next to them. And all the heat's radiating all around. So those are going to be changed out as well. And uh, we'll go from there. I haven't touched the power supply yet. I'm going to get the main board done, or actually the, the two main boards done. And then I'm going to move to the power supply after that. So they also have some tacked on the bottom of the circuit board. 
Gonna have to change those ones too. But uh, I'm still going along. It's taken quite a long time to finish this. I haven't had a lot of time to uh, sit down and work on this thing. So I'm gonna keep going and uh, update will follow shortly. So I'm in the process of changing the black flag polystyrene caps out. And I have one of them hooked up to my analyzer right now. This is a capacitor code 150K, which indicates 15 picofarad at 10%. So if I go up here, I can show you that this is way off. Should be 15, it's hovering right around seven. So this capacitor has failed. And that's the case for most of the capacitors that have been pulling out uh, these black flags. So in a preamp where a few picofarad drift can cause oscillation, you want a reliable cap in there. And these were surely not that. So getting these changed out for these ceramic caps, like I've been doing in various different places, is, uh, is the right way to go. So I'm gonna keep going and I'll come back in a minute. So I've moved to the resistors now. I have one installed. I'm changing all the high watt metal film slash fusible resistors out with high quality Dale resistors. And what I'm doing is I'm forming the leads on these. You can see that the uh, original resistors had the leads formed so they sit above the board uh, so that their heat dissipation won't damage components nearby or the circuit board itself. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing the exact same th uh, thing. I'm forming the leads so that these resistors sit off the board and I'm forming them so they're sitting just a little bit higher, basically the same. Um, and to do that, I have a special tool. This is an Aram 554TX and this allows me to, to form the leads in the tool. And I also have a, a lead bending tool. This is a Pace Conform. This thing is overpriced as hell. I hardly ever use it. The only time I really use these is for these larger resistors. But when I need it, it comes in handy. This is like $40 for this thing. It's pretty stupid. It looks like it was 3D printed, but it works and I use it, so. Um, so I'm gonna keep going on this, install all these new resistors. I have quite a bit, mostly Dale. Actually, all Dale, mostly CMF. So I'm gonna do that and I'll come back when I finish. I forgot to mention what this tool does. It's a lead bending tool. So these two little spikes at the bottom are adjustable. So what you do is you loosen the set screw right here and you find the holes in your PCB that you wanna uh, fit the component through and you line these up, stick the spikes into those holes. Let's see if I can do this one handed, just like that. And then you tighten the set screw and then you put the component inside of this valley right here and you bend the leads down. Let's see if I could show you, kind of like that. Anyway, and uh, you're able to bend the leads and then that way your component, now that I just bent the leads, it's probably not gonna fit, but your component will fit in the circuit board and it'll be nice and straight, just like that. Obviously this is gonna be mounted from the other side, but you get the idea. So I ended up taking the whole main board out. The sunlight's hitting the board just right. It looks pretty cool. Anyway, so the main board's out. The power supply is also out. I ended up just pulling it all apart because as I dug deeper into the cradle over here, it just turned out that removing it entirely was uh, not much extra work, as well as the main board with its ground connections right there. So I'm gonna do everything to this. I have all the new parts for it, as well as the resistors. Here's all the old parts I've changed out so far in terms of resistors and black flags. So, uh, yeah, all the parts labeled. That makes it a lot easier to get it back together. That way you don't have a pile of washers and screws at the end that don't have a home, so. I'm gonna tear this down and clean this chassis up as well. Reflow this board, check the fuse connection, make sure the tangs are tight. And then, uh, yeah, but I have all the new resistors on this board and new black flag capacitors, though the replacements for them anyway. So I'm gonna reflow this entire board as well, clean all the controls, deflux it. Yeah, this thing's gonna clean up really nice. I'm really excited to see how good it looks. So, 
but yeah, lots of work. I think the filters are over here as well, somewhere. Yeah, 1,000 mic, 100 volt. The originals are uh, 800 at 80, so I'm going up a little bit in voltage and capacitance, but uh, that'll actually be an upgrade for this thing. Back then, the capacitor sizes were a lot larger, so even though I'm going up in capacitance and voltage, my height remains the same, and the diameter actually goes down. Um, they mounted these to the bottom side of the board, so clearance for the bracket that just sits right on top of them was critical, so this is all they could use. So uh, going up in capacitance and voltage, and uh, size actually gets smaller, so those will be good. And those are super high quality uh, Nip and Kimicon KYB for power supply, so get this straightened out and I'll come back when I'm done, but here's a look at it. Before I do that, it's pretty nasty. So I'm back with the power supply. I just finished this up. Attention to detail and uh, sensitive work like this does take time especially when you do it, want to do it correctly and you want to change uh, a lot of parts and, and do it neatly and correctly and reflow the board. Um, stuff like that takes time. A lot of people don't realize. People just think that all that's involved is just taking old parts off and putting new parts on. But uh, it's more than that. There's a lot, uh, a lot more involved. But uh, anyway, this thing got uh, all new electrolytic capacitors all around. I used uh, Nichicon UPW and Panasonic FC as well as I think uh, Nichicon Muse, and maybe one or two others. Um, new Dale CMF resistors and high wattage flame, uh, flame proof resistor right here. What else? New trimmers for the positive and negative rails. New uh, C0G ceramic capacitors for the black flag replacements. Oh yeah, I also have, uh, what are those? Nippon Kimicon KZM and KYB for the filters. Really, really, really high quality. Some of the best you could get for their for their rolls. Um, but uh, yeah, reflowed the back. Looks a million times better. The traces are all bubbled, but none of them lifted. Um, these traces are actually pretty nice to work with. They're not really photogenic though. You could see all the bubbling that's taken place over time. Almost every single trace is bubbling like that. It is what it is, but uh, yeah, just turned out really well. Cleaned it up, really nice. I uh, I also replaced the regulators with MJ one five zero three three and one five zero three twos, and I also replaced the I think the relay driver and the discharge transistor as well. So lots of stuff that I did to this, and uh, yeah, it takes time. So I'm going to move over to this board next. I'm probably going to do this tomorrow. Completely reflow it, deflux it, and then move on to the switches and the potentiometers. I think one of these switches actually has a cocoon in it. Let's see if there's a little friend in there that wants to come out. Right there. Anyway, so I'll move on to that tomorrow. But for now, I'm going to go home and sleep. I'm fucking exhausted. One thing I forgot to mention was the fact that I replaced all the rectifier diodes as well. All five of them. I used uh, one N4004. Here's all the old parts, by the way. All the resistors, regulators, the rectifier diodes, trimmers, and a couple other transistors, and the black flags. And the capacitors. You can see every, basically every capacitor used uh, the, the really shitty glue they used to hold them all down. That's been the number one uh, time consumer of this whole restoration was scraping glue. It's just, it was absolutely everywhere. And to do a good job and not scrape the board up it takes time, so. So I will come back, like I said, 
when I begin work on this. So I'm back with the power supply. I have it uh, reinstalled into the cradle and I have it wired up to the mains. I'm just doing some uh, preliminary testing, measuring the voltage rails, making sure everything's adjustable and within spec. And per the service manual, they want plus minus 48.5 in reference to ground, which I have right here. There's my positive supply, 48.5, my negative 48.5. So that's all good. I had to do some adjustment with the trimmers to get it within spec, um, but I did have an issue. I brought this thing up slowly on my Variac and that turned out to be a bad idea. I'll tell you why. This resistor right here, R40, is being used as a bleed down resistor for your supplies. And it's controlled with this relay. Um, this preamp, when this relay doesn't have voltage across the coil, the contacts are closed, which in turn puts this resistor to ground. And I'll show you that with a schematic. So here's one of your supply rails. It comes down and it goes to this resistor, which goes to this relay to ground when the contact's closed. In the schematic, the relay contact is open because in the schematic, it, it depicts the, the coil energized, so the, re, so the relay is basically open. But when you don't have coil voltage here, or proper coil voltage, as it's, I should say, uh, the relay contact is going to be closed, which puts this resistor direct to ground. So, like I said, when you variac it, you're never going to have proper coil voltage here, and um, which in, which in turn just ties this resistor direct to ground at all times. Um, so that's not good. That's why the resistor smoked, and uh, the old one's here. I'm going to install the new one after I take this uh, this cheaper one out. Um, I use this one just to test. I didn't want to smoke another Dale resistor. That would have been a little bit annoying. So now that I know that, I'm gonna put the new Dale in, uh, clean up the area one more time, and then I'm gonna move on to the main board. But now that I know the power supply is working, I'm gonna be able to build up the preamp uh, and move on from there. So if you have one of these, don't variac it. You're gonna end up uh, smoking your bleed down resistor and uh, think you have another issue on hand like I did. So uh, yeah. Quick update, I have the potentiometer out for the volume. I'm gonna pull the balance pot out too, and I'm just gonna surface these things with some D100L. These are actually pretty clean. They're not gonna need a lot of work whatsoever. I'm probably not even gonna pull them apart entirely. I'm just gonna service them just like this, and then access the bottom one through there. The main circuit board I'm gonna to move to after that while I have the potentiometers off. And like you've seen before, this thing's really rough. It's going to need a lot of work. I'm also going to polish the uh, contact points down here for those plugs. All right, I'm going to keep going and uh, update will follow soon.
And here's the finished board. I just uh, finished reflowing and defluxing this and uh, doing some other finishing touches, including uh, polishing the pins, treating those, cleaning the switches and potentiometers, securing the wire looms. It's, uh, that was a really big job, but uh, I'm glad it's done. It looks really good. And I can't wait to get this thing back into the chassis. It doesn't even look like the same preamp anymore. Absolutely superb. I managed to remove basically every single drop of flux off of this thing. So the top of the board looks so good. As does the bottom. Far, far cry from what it was so i'm gonna get this thing uh bolted into the chassis i'll probably take some more videos as i go but uh i'm uh, very very excited to get this thing installed so let's go okay i'm in the process of putting the preamp back together i have the main board installed and the supports for the main board installed as well i have it uh, soldered to the power supply And I have all the support screws in. I have uh, the push pole uh, rod for this switch right here. I just lubricated that with some synthetic oil. So now it's nice and smooth. I have all the nuts on, the potentiometers and switches that hold it to this front subplate, or this, I'm sorry, the middle support. So now I'm gonna get the front subplate installed. This houses all the axles for the uh, controls and the switches. And then the faceplate gets bolted to this. So it sits down on here, something like this. Just like that. And then it gets screwed down and then you tighten all the shafts, um, set screws. But uh, I'm not to, just to that point yet. I still have a couple other things to do. So uh, I'll be back in a second. Okay, it's starting to look like a preamp again. I have basically the entire sub-assembly put together. It went together well with no issue. I have the uh, set screws all tight. I have the front switches installed and mounted and wired up. And uh, so far so good. The next step is to move to the rear panel. This is gonna require a lot of work. It's gonna get all new RCA jacks, except for the tape loop. We're gonna leave those alone. I'm just gonna clean them up. And we're gonna put an IEC inlet on there. And uh, polish it as well, it's pretty nasty. I'll show you guys how to replace these RCA jacks. I know some people actually run into these and they have issues, but it's really easy to do. The RCA jacks on this are kind of shitty because the ground connection relies on a crimp that fails over time. So they like to uh, they like to break, and then it, that shoots DC in your amplifier. You don't want that. So let's get to it. Here's a quick tutorial on how to replace one of these RCA jacks. I'm only going to show you how to do one because I have quite a few to do, but. The first step you want to take is to cut off the stem. I have just a pair of flush cutters here. Just cut the stem off. Just like that. And that'll leave you with the center section and it'll leave you with the ground. Now I'm going to get another pair of pliers here. Make sure to grab beforehand. You're going to want to take this ground connection here, you're just gonna to wanna to pry at it, just like this. 
The only thing that holds this ground down are these two little crimps here. You can see them try to point to it right here and right here. This ground plate is basically just attached mechanically. So when you pry this off, it'll just leave this behind. So now I come on this side with a pair of pliers and just pull this off. Got to be careful not to break the mounting plate. If that doesn't work, just come back in here with your little cutters and straighten these two tangs out that are holding it. Just like that. And then this should pop out. Just like that. Now what you're gonna wanna do, because this hole is not, uh, not round, it's pretty irregular, it looks like a cross. You're gonna wanna take an angled step drill bit or a drill bit that fits the size of your RCA jacks. You're gonna wanna clean that hole out. Just like that. And if I take my RCA jacks now, these should fit through. And if they don't, then you'll have to enlarge, enlarge the hole further. So not big enough yet. So I'll have to bring it to the next size. Just like that. And there you go. And because this is a plastic or phenolic plate, you don't need these spacers. These are only if you're mounting it to metal. These isolate the ground. Just clean this up a little bit. Get your nut on. Tighten it down. And look at that. As good as new. And then what you do is you just tighten the nut and then what you do is uh, just solder your connections there and uh, you're good to go. So I'm gonna do that with all the other ones and I'll come back when I finish. I'm making some progress with the rear panel. I have the set of RCA jacks all set to go. Have them all soldered up. I'm gonna move on to the outputs now. Kenwood used some pretty crappy um, non-shielded wire for that. So I'm gonna change that out with uh, some Stranded core shielded coax, pure copper. I think these are silver plated and the uh, jacket is Teflon. So these are pretty high quality. I'm also using a uh, Kimber TCSS hookup wire for all my ground. And I have the, the uh, other two RCA jacks here and all my hardware in these cups here. I'm gonna move on to the back panel after that and get this polished up. You can see underneath the plate how clean it was and how dirty the rest of it is. So I'm gonna clean that up. I'm probably gonna to try to take that dent out too. And then I'm gonna put the IC in that right there. So let's get to it. Okay, I'm back with the L07C2. It's been a few days since I've worked on this thing. It seems like I'm getting less and less time to uh, work on audio gear lately. Work has been uh, pretty busy. But uh, I have the IEC inlet installed and I'll wire it in. And I have the output jacks and the input jacks wired in too. I had to uh, make a custom plate for the input jacks. Or I'm sorry, the output jacks because the plastic plate that they were mounted to cracked upon removal. So um, I fabricated that plate and I used the isolators that came with these RCA jacks. And the isolators actually fit right inside the hole. So perfect fit. And I just reused the, the, the mounting plate for the input. And then what I did was I also polished up the tape loop RCA inputs. Those came out pretty nice. The rear panel um, cleaned up really well, but it is pretty stained. Um, all that residue you see on there, that's actually just stains from whatever used to be on this thing that uh, interacted with the paint. So I polished it up as good as I could, but it's never going to be perfect. If you look at it at an angle, you can see how shiny it is, but it, uh, it'll never be perfect, but anyway, other than that, I'm going to move on to the cosmetic, um, aspects of the faceplate now. 
I'm gonna clean the faceplate up. Um, I'm not sure how I'm gonna clean this thing because it's a it's a satin finish, so I don't know if I want to polish it. Um, but yeah, it uh, it's not in too bad a shape. It should clean up pretty well. Now the top cover is a different story. The top cover is in pretty rough shape. There's a lot of scratches and gouges on the top. It's not terrible, but it definitely needs a little bit of TLC. You can see all the shit that's inside the uh, the fake vents that are on the top. I'm not sure why Kenwood did this. They, I guess it's just aesthetics. These aren't actually vents. They, uh, they don't go all the way through. So, um, but yeah, I'm gonna work on that. And when I come back, we'll uh, we'll have this basically all assembled, and we'll move on to testing. But for now, it uh, turned out really well. I'm really happy with it. Just give you a quick shot of the insides. But yeah, this thing looks great. All right, when I come back, like I said, we'll have this thing put together and uh, we'll go from there. So I've had some people ask me about how I wash face plates. So all I do is I dunk it in hot water and I uh, coat it with soap. I have a uh, stiff bristle brush that I use. And this allows me to get down into the, uh, into the face plate and clean all the grime off and dust. And then I follow that up with a, just a regular rag and that, uh, that usually gives the best results. You don't really want to use anything too harsh on the faceplate as it could uh, damage it over time. So I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. All right, guys, here it is. I have the faceplate cleaned up and polished and reinstalled, as well as the knobs and switches. I have the top plate cleaned up as well. Look how good that looks. Totally different from what it was uh, from the photos that you saw. Took a lot of work. I used uh, Simichrome to polish it up, final touches to it, and that uh, made it look next to brand new. Um, all the switches are nice and smooth. I lubricated everything and cleaned them all, so um, selection is all noiseless. No pops and static, no channel dropouts. The volume control feels really, really good. The tone controls work. There's no, again, there's no static, no channel dropouts, as well as the balance. So everything works really, really well, physically, um, as well as electrically. I have this uh, measuring distortion right now if I flip back to auxiliary, you'll see that my distortion is all the way down to uh, sitting right around 002423. So that's perfect, and that's unweighted. So if I if I do some A weighting, it goes down to 0017. Um, both channels track evenly. Both channels have the same distortion. The phono stage runs well. The regulators, the new regulators that I installed, they run nice and cool. You can actually put your hands on the heatsink now. Before you couldn't do that, they were running way too hot. So putting these new MJs in really helps out, as well as the other modifications to the power supply that I did and the rest of the circuit. And the finishing touches just speak for themselves. They're, uh, they're really, really nice. The final product is uh, a far cry from what it was. I have the new feet installed as well. And you've seen the back panel. I'll show that one more time. So overall, I'm really, really happy with the finished product. This is gonna be a perfect match to the 
L07M Mark IIs that I worked on for the same guy. So he's gonna be really happy. So I'm gonna just verify some other things here and then I'll get it onto the hi-fi rack and we'll give it a quick listen. So here's all the parts I changed out, mostly capacitors. I think there were uh, around 74 capacitors. And I also did the black flags, the resistors, the trimmers, and some semis. I think there were right around 25 black flag capacitors and around 30 resistors. I also did the RCA jacks, the feet. I removed that courtesy outlet to fit the IC in. I removed this crappy internal wiring and I ditched that lamp cord for an IC inlet. So quite a few parts. Definitely a comprehensive job. All for a really nice finished product. Super happy with it. And here's the finished product. I just got this thing buttoned up after doing some final tests and measurements. Looks really good. I got new screws for the top panel as the other ones were all stripped out. I didn't have any countersunk screws, so I just used these. And they work well enough, they look pretty good. The new feet look really good. They're gonna match the uh, L07M Mark IIs. If I didn't already mention, the uh, the RCA jacks as well as the IEC inlet matches the monoblocks that I did for them too. The back looks really good. And the top came out really well too. There's some scratches here and there, but no big deal. I have it hooked up to the uh, Technics SEA7 that I also restored. I have a video of this on my channel as well if you want to check it out. But yeah, this is a really good combo. But I have a feeling this, uh, this preamp is going to sound even better with the uh, monoblocks. This was definitely one of my more comprehensive restorations. This, uh, this took a lot of work to get it to where it is. As you see in the video, I think this is going to be my longest video. It's probably going to be pushing over 50 minutes long, so it's well worth it though. I like sharing these videos. And to answer some questions, uh, I don't do this as a full-time job. This is just a side hobby for me. And uh, I rarely work on more than two or three pieces of equipment a month. And when I do, I like to put them on YouTube, so. It definitely uh, extends the restoration process though, recording video and editing video and taking multiple clips. It definitely adds up, but uh, lots of people like seeing these videos, so. This is gonna be a longer format video. Um, I think the longest video on my channel right now is about 35 minutes. And that's the L07M Mark IIs. So this one's gonna be pushing over 50. I was thinking about putting this into a, uh, a two or three part video, but I think I'm just gonna release it as a full 50 minute video. I think it'll be good enough just to do that but uh, yeah this thing just looks great
probably put a demo, a dedicated demo of this preamp running with this amplifier on my channel next. So keep an eye out for that. But uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna keep using this thing and listening to it just for the time being. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to throw them down in the comment section. And uh, like the video and subscribe too if you want. Thanks.